All right. So thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And uh, we are going to be talking in this session about uh, issues uh, in agile software development and a novel way of thinking about them. My name is Christian van Boven. I work for Nagra uh, Kudelski. Nagra Kudelski is a Swiss company that uh, has multiple brands. Nagra Kudelski itself is focused on multi-screen video and digital TV software solutions with uh, sister companies uh, such as uh, Kudelski Security that is involved in cybersecurity, Ski Data that is in public access. So those are the systems you will find on parkings or ski resorts uh, that allow you to enter uh, these spaces, as well as an emerging activity around Internet of Things uh, with systems uh, that intend to reduce uh, issues like car theft. So we have uh, a group as well in Wales. For myself, uh, I'm based out of Madrid, Spain, so I, I apologize for not making it into the UK with these ever-changing travel policies. I uh, was a bit unsure. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the experience we've had at Nagra in developing our Open TV product range. Uh, Open TV is, is really a modular system that includes uh, user applications and a service platform called Open TV Platform, uh, intending to bring a rich media consumption uh, on a lot of different media entertainment devices, whether that's a big screen, mobile, PC, uh, or any other type of uh, device. And we have been developing that over the past decade. Uh, there has been ups and downs, and so I wanted to share um, that here with you uh, in, in, in my session. The objective is really to introduce you to systems thinking in the agile of, uh, in the context of agile software development. Although systems thinking is applied across a lot of different contexts, uh, even into areas such as biology. But the goal here is really to think about what is a wider business context, uh, how do people interrelate and also to explore the concept of uh, feedback loops and how that may affect our little world of agile software development. It's also uh, the idea is to really try and use systems thinking as a tool to visualize dynamic processes to help us bring a bigger perspective um, and really um, try to see uh, if, it, if it works to help us identify a few common issues uh, and also to validate if we can easily figure out how these factors are influencing into the issues that, that we are uh, exploring. It's not really about doing an exhaustive analysis of these issues. It's really more, how can we think uh, about big picture issues? How can we um, find a way to potentially even influence decisions that need to be made uh, to help us uh, improve um, how we are going about our developments? So let me start by talking about learning organizations and systems thinking. Uh, there is a lot of literature on systems thinking, but one of uh, the early books coming from a tradition at MIT is, is called The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. Systems thinking is really introduced as a discipline to see the structures that underlie the complex situations, but also importantly to figure out what is your high leverage versus low leverage? In other words, where are the areas in the system that merit most focus and attention for us to improve on things? There's, it's called the fifth discipline because uh, according to this author, uh, there's two main areas uh, that merit attention. One is on the left-hand side is about personal mastery and shared vision. And that's all about the ambition of individual employees as well as a wider organization or wider team. And the personal mastery is really about figuring out what is it that drives you in life, uh, but also to, to relate that and compare that to what is your reality, to see the reality for what it is. And that drives what uh, the author calls a creative tension. And that's ultimately what drives us at, uh, at the personal level in terms of ambition. 
uh, the view is that these personal visions bubble up uh, into a shared vision, shared across wider teams, wider organizations, and that will really bring groups of people towards a single objective uh, with, with a much higher intensity. Now, ambition is good, but on the, on the right hand side, as you see, it's also about how do we learn. Agile is about adapting to our wider environment, and it's important that we start to realize how our brains are actually working, how we process information, how we make mental models. Often our mental models are very preconceived. Uh, we may have stereotypical views, and they may hamper us to analyze problems in the best possible way. That's not only true at the personal level, but that's also true at the team learning. Ideally, you want that the IQ of a combined team is bigger than the IQs of the individuals, whereas in practice, often that you know may be rather the opposite. It's also important to, to have a dialogue to figure out ways how you create a dialogue and how you have a discussion uh, in order to arrive uh, to that. In a nutshell, really systems thinking is, is an evolution of how we traditionally think about cause and effect. In a very traditional linear cause effect thinking, what you often face is that you look at the discrepancy between the goal and the reality, and you try to find a simple fix for that. So you may have a situation where your sales are below your target, that's causing discrepancy. And so your decision is let's hire maybe another sales representative. So simple problem, simple fix. What systems thinking introduces is this notion that life may be a little bit more complex. Uh, there is this notion of complexity theory, but importantly, you have this notion of feedback loops. So life often feeds back onto itself. And you have two types of loops. You have a reinforcing loop, whereby if a certain element, a certain entity uh, starts increasing, it feeds into other entities over this whole loop, and ultimately it feeds back positively onto itself. So that's a positive loop, and that is often the case when you see things like exponential growth. A balanced loop in contrast means that when a certain entity goes up, uh, other entities may be positively going up along with that, but it may ultimately feed back in a negative way. That's hence the minus sign. So it will bring about a, a negative change. And that means that it's inherently balanced and that uh, anything will try to converge to a certain uh, uh, overall value. Uh, there's also the notion in systems thinking of about time and flow. In other words, you can have delays in the system. Delays may have very important, cause very important aspects and very important effects. And you also have a notion of a flow rate. In other words, you may have a source that is generating something, is creating an inventory at a certain flow rate. So there's a whole notion of the dynamic aspects of a system. What is important is this system in and by itself and the structure generates its own effects. So it's not just every entity that contributes to how a system behaves, but is the interrelationship of the system that will uh, actually act and has uh, start to live its own life. It's as if when you cut up, uh, you will you would cut up a person into pieces. The individual organs cannot do anything meaningful. It's only when you have these organs coming together and interacting with each other that you can talk about human life. So it's it's really a different way of thinking. We in science there's a lot of uh, reductionism cutting up pieces to smaller and smaller items. This is actually about synthesizing uh, different elements and understanding their relationship. So a few examples to make this a bit more less abstract. On the left hand side, you see some reinforcement loops. A viral product would be a good example. Your product sales will, uh, if your product sales start to increase, it means you have more and more customers and more customers in a positive world will bring you more positive word of mouth. That feeds back into product sales. So that's a very simplistic view how you, you, you create a viral product. Another option or another example would be a bull market in cryptocurrencies. If your crypto price is going up, 
people start talking about it in the social media and people start uh, to have a fear of missing out, uh, which will drive the buying pressure and will in turn again increase your price. So that's where you see these exponential um, you know, increases in things like cryptocurrencies. And that's what is called a bull market. In terms of balancing loops, uh, if you look at the world of software development, often you have this situation where you have a delivery loop and if you have an increasing amount of product sales, your backlog will go up, but that will start also to drive up your delivery time. Now, if your delivery time goes up and up, your customer satisfaction will be negatively affected and that will have an impact on product sales. So as you can see, uh, that is actually a balancing loop. Um, ultimately, everything gets balanced out to a certain level. If we think again about cryptocurrencies, if crypto will go up, it's quite possible that the demand for mining rigs, uh, the hardware that will do this mining, that this demand will go up. But then regulators may step in. If you look at a recent example in China, people may not like the impact that this has on the environment. And so thereby, uh, with these regulators stepping in, it may have a negative effect on your market sentiment that may again feed back to the price. So this acts also to stabilize uh, the cryptocurrency price. In terms of the flow rate, a typical example in software development would obviously be a backlog uh, that can be handled by a team at a certain flow rate, and which then leads to a certain amount of work done. So these are some very simple loops. Um, so when we have now understood these basics of how systems thinking goes about analyzing uh, systems, of course, actual systems tend to be much more complex. Uh, this is just uh, still simplistic drawing, but here we put together a few of the loops that we discussed before. You can see that the crypto price is driven re in a reinforcement loop uh, by this buying pressure and fear of missing out and is balanced, as we saw before, uh, maybe by uh, regulatory scrutiny that will pop in. So this, on one hand, you have growth. On the other hand, it's, it's becoming a balanced growth because there is some limit into the system. It's also interesting to see that this mining rig demand in and by itself um, will also be balanced out because the mining rig demand may have an effect on the backlog of these producers of these mining rigs. And they, when their backlog is starting to go up, um, then component availability might be an issue. As you know, we are now are facing a worldwide shortage on electronic components. That, again, that may have an impact on the delivery time. And when this delivery time is, is increasing, ultimately people may give up and ultimately demand might uh, have to fall down. Uh, again, it's not limited to just single feedback loops. There can be very complex interdependencies. I've just shown one example, the component availability. Um, it might get some attention from people and then the component availability and shortages in and by itself may affect uh, the people, people's fear of missing out. So as you can see, uh, there's lots of links in, in a system, and this is just something I was, I was intending to, uh, to, to keep very simple. But in reality, um, this, is, um, this is one way. This is one way of looking at reality. And it's also one way where we can link our own software development world to the reality around us that will definitely affect us. What is interesting is systems theory provides us some guidance, what areas we can um, work on that have more leverage, that will have more capability to improve. But at the same time, as you can see with these different loops and these different influences in the system, fault lines can emerge, different loops may emerge people may take incompatible approaches, views and objectives, and each of them will, will affect each other. So system dynamics in these kind of complex systems can have a lot of effects beyond what you originally think. And ultimately, if you ignore that, you may ha have a very suboptimum outcome. We will explore a few of these fault lines and a few issues that you may encounter in, in agile development. One model that systems theory provides is the iceberg model. And it's a bit similar to the five whys in the sense that you start from the event in your problem, 
you may face an issue, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. And there's really multiple levels to look at it and try to understand this. The first level is about patterns and trends. So you can ask yourself, well, what trends have we seen over time? Is there, is this occurring more often? Can I kind of make sense out of this? One level below that is the kind of diagrams and structures we have just seen. In other words, what has influenced these patterns and why is this happening? Are there relationships between these different parts that can explain this system behavior? And that's where you want to think about your overall system and, and its design. At the deepest level, often changing, improving a system, transforming a system depends on understanding the mental models. People may have assumptions, belief systems, may have values that will keep a system functioning in a particular way and probably not always in the best possible way. So often you have to ask yourself, what are the beliefs that keep this system in place and why is it actually, uh, why is it so hard to change? And those are, you know, um, this is just a way of, of thinking that uh, systems theory proposes um, to, to, as a systematic approach uh, to, to this analysis. So enough theory, let's look at a few examples. I've personally experienced most of these examples over the last uh, last decade uh, doing software development. As you will see, they can be quite varied. Um, and so let's dive straight into that. The first example I wanted to bring up is the notion of software complexity and software dependencies. I think software dependencies are one of the biggest headaches that, that faces our industry. And that's all the events we typically see is that software systems become very complex, interdependent, vulnerable, or vendor monopolies may be causing an issue, uh, might hinder this interoperability. The overall pattern of the industry, I would say most people would probably agree that software industry has gone into more and more specialization as it has been growing. There's more and more a notion of an API as a service, simply because people um, need that interoperability. And there's also an overall increasing usage of open source, again, looking at, at a quite uh, long time span. So the structures, a few structures we can see is that people that are successful in building APIs, whether it is between companies, sometimes even within one company, people that build this API, they have a better chance of creating a positive feedback loop where all these companies, all these teams uh, build something that is bigger than the sum of its parts. Also, open source um, often uh, has a lot of uh, reinforcing loops and it, it, it often can, can get a huge share and, and it avoids this issue uh, of vendor monopolies. Now, people may have mental models. So again, these are a few cartoonish type of mental models. For example, one model could be that people and um, companies getting dominant, they will then by default abuse their monopoly power. Another thought process is often that open source initiatives, you know, might be a little bit fragile. They might fall apart very easily. So have to be careful using them. Again, different people will have different mental models. They may not always be very upfront with them, but they will potentially, uh, you know, keep a structure in place. So just to, to show this a bit more in detail, what these structures uh, and the systems thinking, we have this notion of API economy. Often in inside companies, there's also a notion that APIs are shared between different teams. So how can we understand that? How can we understand this increasing trend? Again, if you look at the left-hand loop here, you will see that there's this increase of market specialization that drives the need for APIs, which in turn ensures that people will actually implement these APIs. But the richness of the APIs coming into place drives up, again, can, can give people inspiration to make the system even more complex, functionally speaking, and thereby it, it may itself drive, again, a further market specialization. On the other hand, uh, another reinforcing loop is that this API implementation, when there's more and more and more APIs becoming available or the APIs becoming more and more richer, they will obviously be used by third parties. These third parties and the original company 
may create a richer combined functionality, which has the opportunity, gives the opportunity to increase sales. Now, once sales start to increase, R&D budgets go up, and of course, this feeds back onto a richer API. So you will see this whole API economy. Uh, th these are concepts that you're aware of, but you can see that there is very powerful reinforcement uh, mechanisms that come into place. Uh, in terms of open source, how do we understand open source? Um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that open source, uh, structurally speaking, is a bit different from uh, closed source. Indeed, if you have a certain product need, uh, you, you can uh, obviously an increasing need for a certain product will give rise to um, more products that could be closed source. Uh, those closed source products, when, when they start to come into play, they will increase your license sales. Uh, which in turn will will lead people to use these products and increase the usage. And then this increased usage may again drive more uh, need for products. So that's um, a growth scenario for a traditional closed source product. In open source products, uh, when you have this product need, it can give rise to one or multiple open source projects. Open source projects uh, may lead to the creation of companies that will sell services like hosting or maintenance. And once those companies start emerging, once those sales uh, are available, it may lead to increased confidence and therefore more usage by the industry at large of these products. Once this usage goes up, again, it can feed back into more need for these, for these products. So we have a similar reinforcing loop uh, like in the case of closed source. However, uh, in case of open source, you also have this notion of partners that can become interested, which feeds into um, partners potentially contributing to this open source, and that will feed more and more interest into this area of this open source project. Now, the partner contributions in and by themselves may create more awareness of this project, and this awareness may lead to more usage. So again, you have a third reinforcement loop that comes into play. Um, and even without sales, even without license sales, you have this other dynamic that can increase the adoption of such a project. So as you can see, structurally open source is a bit different. I think we all know that open source projects feel different, have different dynamics. And so this is a very simplistic way I try to depict that and, and, and it makes it a bit more visual. So that was, we've dealt now with complexity of software. Uh, now let's turn um, our attention to organizational uh, issues. Um, often in companies, other types of organizations, people are not really aligned in terms of their objectives. So some again cartoonish examples could be that sales are increasing, but R&D cannot really meet demand. Or maybe you have quality issues that are starting to affect customer satisfaction. So the patterns that often emerge is that more sales will lead invariably to higher delivery delays uh, where R&D cannot hire fast enough, especially this year. Hiring is a very you know, interesting challenge for all of us. And then you know, product management might ask R&D to be creative and where you know, R&D starts pulling out their hair. I'm sure that these are familiar patterns that you have seen uh, because I think there's books written about each of these. Now, the structures are that you have different loops in your system, different incentives that are really not aligned and that are starting to interact a little bit chaotically. And also importantly, often delays in the system, hiring delays may not be anticipated. You know, when sales was selling a system, they may not have anticipated that hiring instead of two months now suddenly takes four or five months. And these are, uh, you know, structural issues uh, that, that influence uh, the overall behavior. So mentally, often people are stuck in their own little mind, like sales might be focused on increasing their sales, trying to get their quota and thinking, being absolutely convinced that R&D has absolutely no clue uh, what they're facing. Whereas R&D doesn't want to overcommit in fear of being blamed, out of fear of being blamed and being very strongly convinced that sales is playing a reckless game. I'm sure that you have seen these mental models play out uh, somewhere near you as well. So how would we very simplistically 
draw that. Multiple parts of the organization can live in their own loops, can have their own little world. Um, here I'm, I'm showing four different loops. For example, sales is really driven. Imagine your sales team is coming up to speed, is growing. Imagine you're a startup. Your orders are starting to go up. Your revenues are starting to go up, which then gives you the confidence to increase again your sales team. So that's an exponential growth in a, in a, in a good case. Now, a second loop about product, the product loop is all about seeing the orders, having to manage an increasing backlog, but the backlog in turn has an impact now on the delivery time. You cannot do everything uh, as quickly maybe as you used to be. And then over time with a certain delay, that may affect negatively your customer satisfaction. So this is a balanced loop and you have to often, the work of product management is to find this balance and to make some hard choices. Whereas R&D in their little world will, will, will see this delivery time. Um, they will have their own objectives of being able to deliver certain things in a certain time span. So it may create this gap in delivery time that might start to go up, which may lead to a hiring plan. But as we know, especially this year, hiring delays come then into play. And then it's only after a certain time that you really manage to get your delivery capacity up to the level that you want. And, and manage to then, um, you know, get your delivery time back uh, under control. Whereas finance, maybe every three months, maybe every year, maybe at a different uh, periodicity, has their budgeting exercise. Often they will look at what are your revenues and depending on your revenues, you will be allowed to have a certain level of hiring plan. You're allowed to, to hire a certain amount of people. So really, these organizations may be working against each other or they may actually be aware of the bigger picture and uh, figure out what to do. Um, there's many examples in the industry where people have either overinvested or maybe more dramatically underinvested. And it's, it's systems theory will typically tell you that you have to focus on your balance loops rather than your reinforcing loops. In other words, in this kind of scenario, it doesn't help to create more and more sales incentives if you're not addressing your balance loops, if you're not thinking about proactively addressing uh, the issues that you will have uh, in your R&D or in, in your product management. Delays are an important aspect of such a system. And also another aspect without going into details, quality objectives are very important. If you, one way to solve this type of problems is to let your delivery time or your quality objective drop down, drop your standards, but that has very negative long-term effects as well. To go into a total different uh, area, um, let's think about the software development process itself. When we are talking about developing features, often features are about multiple skills that need to be combined, like a backend with a client, uh, maybe a designer, um, and so uh, it's possible that this can, you know, lead uh, or be fed into teams that are overloaded. Also, sometimes we are faced with the need to look at, at new technology, but we don't have the skills, we don't have a team for that. So those are some problems you may face at some points. Um, the patterns that often emerge is that these features may actually be component related features, meaning in a very isolated part of a system, or they may be very complex interactions at a lot of components. And so they are end to end. A pattern that is often discussed is, do you want to have a, a functional team? Do you want to tackle this in a functional organization or do you want to have a product driven organization, a more um, you know, vertically feature oriented team? So the structures here that are interesting to look at, and we'll look at them in a minute, is what is your development flow and how are the dependencies uh, built along with that flow? Important is also what do you do when you have a continuous cycle of new uh, requirements, of feature evolutions, and how do you replan for that? People can have a very strong mindset uh, in organizations and often different companies have different, very, very different mindsets. Um, uh, people can go into a very functional mindset where they say, well, the important part for us is to have best in class competencies. We want to build competencies and we want to have 
uh, the best in class um, employees uh, dealing with each of these. Other people may have a mental model where it's all about self-sufficient feature teams, like in like in Agile, and you want to have any no dependencies whatsoever, and we want to have these kind of feature teams or product teams uh, that are um, totally important. Reality is probably you you want to be somewhat open-minded because different circumstances uh, may 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 give you different answers or different ways of thinking about it. Again, this is a very simplistic picture that I'm drawing here, but imagine you have two cases on the left and on the right. On the left hand, you see a case whereby you have feature teams, single teams. So very nice, you have a backlog, you can analyze, think about it. You have a bucket of work that needs to be done and your feature team can autonomously bring that and create certain output. So that uh, seems nice, a very simple uh, process. On the other hand, if you start to face a situation where features require two teams to get involved, you then have two buckets of work to be done. Each of these teams may have very different rates of, of you know, implementation that they can deal with. They will come up with some items that need to be integrated. In the best case, these items uh, are directly translated into work output, but they also may face an issue that they may face issues that need triaging, need analysis. And then in turn, that leads to items that team one and team two needs to fix. So that feeds back to their bucket of work to be done. The problem here is that um, teams may not have the same dynamic, may not have the same level of backlog. And this may become a lot less predictable in terms of um, throughput or uh, predicting uh, time of features to become available. So it's much more complex. It's not necessarily that the model on the right hand is always worse. It's just something where you need to deal with this complexity and you need to be realistic in terms of what you can expect from these kind of systems and structures to, to do in reality. So we've talked about organizations. We've talked uh, about uh, skill sets, but what about the technology and the tools itself? 